Stage one, I believed in Santa Claus. Stage two, I didn't believe in Santa Claus. Stage three, I began to question the psychological and sociological implications of teaching children about Santa Claus. <laughs> Stage four, I had children and became Santa Claus. <laughs> Stage five, my children grew older and they said they knew it was me that was Santa Claus. And now I'm in stage six. I am beginning to look like Santa Claus. <laughs> I do know that when the time comes for my life to end, I want to be like the old fellow I heard about who died peacefully in his sleep, not yelling and screaming like the rest of the people in his car. <laughs> Shel Silverstein wrote a wonderful poem about growing old. Said the little boy, Sometimes I drop my spoon. I do that too, said the little old man. The little boy whispered, I wet my pants. I do that too, laughed the little old man. Said the little boy, I often cry. The old man nodded, so do I. But worst of all, said the boy, it seems adults don't pay any attention to me and he felt the warmth of a wrinkled old hand. I know what you mean, said the little old man. Sometimes people ask me why someone my age would want to continue to teach when I could relax at home without worrying about lectures or grading or student evaluation. I would like to share with you some of the things that continue to draw me to the university the classrooms, the students, the searching, the energy, and why I can laugh when a student comments about my age and my memory and my hearing. There are wonderful things the young and middle-aged faculty member brings to the university, but I truly believe that there are things one brings with age and with experience and with memory. I'm always reminded of, again, what I call a folk verse that goes, an old man crossing a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm, deep and wide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim, for the sullen stream held no fear for him. But he turned when he reached the other side and builded a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting your time with building here. You have crossed the river deep and wide. Why build you a bridge at even tide? The traveler raised his old gray head. Good friend, on the path I have come, he said, there follows after me today a youth who too must pass this way. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. It was in January of 1964 that I came to the EMU campus as a faculty member. I am now in my 46th year of teaching, 45 of those years here at EMU. When I came to EMU to teach, there was no Mark Jefferson and there was no Prey Herald. I watched them being built. Now I listen to plans for rejuvenating and modernizing them. I've been on campus longer than both of these buildings. But no one has ever suggested getting money for me from the state for facelifts and body tucks. I am reminded of a song I learned when I was in camp. Why don't it rain on me? Why don't it rain on me? The flowers, the, the rain makes the flowers and the trees beautiful. Why don't it rain on me? I do want to share some of my perceptions of what the university and the professors and the students are doing and have been doing for well over 2,000 years. It's not my intention to discuss educational philosophy, but rather to talk about what happens to a, to a person when they are a part of a university. There's a poem again that I learned some years ago that says it pretty well. My heart is like an old sea captain sailing the high seas for many years. It has seen many wonders terrible frights. The rain has poured, the winds have blown, the sun has baked, the pirates have plundered. 
Even after all this, the old sea captain retains his strength. He retains his youth and passion. Sometimes a tattered and torn heart has more love than any else. For because it has experienced and endured so much, it can truly appreciate that which is most sacred. I believe the university is the most noble of all human institutions. From our ancient universities that created things like numbering systems, to the Academy of Plato, and then later the Arabic universities that succeeded in saving the work of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato to the ages, uh, to the Middle Ages and the Age of Enlightenment. The university has been a place of sacred trust, integrity, and advanced learning. Because I believe that it still is the purpose of a university, I continue to have my students write papers and have them speak aloud, trying to instill in them the tools that I call the skills of the educated mind. It is at the university that we try to instill in students a sense of the role they have as a scholar, to learn basic foundation information, to ask questions, to do research, and to communicate ideas in grammatically correct written and oral style. It is also the role of the educated mind to advance knowledge and to make use of technology in the human experience while considering the moral and ethical dimensions of what we are doing. I amaze myself almost daily with the technology that is available to students today. At the time I started teaching at EMU, there were no home computers. No word processors, no copy machines, no handheld calculators, no digital clocks or watches, no GPS devices, no cellular telephones. In fact, it was in 1957, the year I graduated from high school, that touch-tone phones came into being and the Soviet Union sent its first satellite into space. College students who had cars could pull up to a gas pump, have someone come out and pump their gas, put a dollar's worth in, and the student drive away with three more gallons than they had when they pulled up. There was no significant importation of Japanese cars. Men walking on the moon was the stuff of science fiction. Drugs were a part of life only if one was physically sick. I am also very much aware that I am alive today because of the miracles of modern medicine. I have two titanium hips, a pig aortic valve, and I've suffered through a dissected aorta. In May, I'm expecting to have another miracle of modern medicine when once again, I have to have major surgery on my aorta. As a side note though, I need to tell you, in the early days of computers, I used to wish that my computer was easy as my computer, that my computer was as easy as my telephone to understand. I do want you to know my wishes come true. I don't understand my telephone now either. <laughs> there was a great sense of personal satisfaction that I read about a situation in which a young man was giving an older man a hard time and suggesting that the old man had been left behind because of technology. He said, the student, you grew up in a different world, almost the primitive one. We, the young people of today, grew up with television, jet planes, space travel, men walking on the moon. We have sent spacecraft to Mars. We have nuclear energy, electric and hydrogen cars, computers with light speed processing, and at this yet point, the young man stopped to take a sip of beer. The old man took advantage of the break long enough to say, you're right, son. We didn't have any of those things when we were young, so we invented them. Now, you arrogant little fart, what are you going to do for the next generation? <laughs> In the future, young intellectuals like you who are here tonight will make major contributions based on your ability to utilize science, technology, and information in new and creative ways. Part of the role of the university is to first provide a foundation in science technology, and information, and then to provide the inspiration 
and the desire that makes use of that education in working for the betterment of humankind.